All right. So tonight, I want to essentially create papers four and five or whatever they are um, for Walmart. So you can see the process. I won't actually write the paper, but just so you see the process. So you can see the actual calculation. So let's start with the discount rate. You start off with what the end parts are. So you got the risk free rate, the market risk premium. And the betas so you, you probably should have a section titled each one of those things so i don't need a, a discussion on what capital asset pricing model is you could say you know in, in this section we we're going to come up with the discount rate for our company using capital asset pricing model you didn't go any further than that everybody knows what that is you know your boss would actually be insulted if you put that in a paper i don't count off for it to me, it's like students documenting what they learn. That's not bad, but it, you would not do it in a real life paper. It's the same thing with the CFA research. You just, you have a discount rate and no one ever asks you about it. So you just go with, so we're gonna do these. So remember this, the source on each one of these, this is the 10 year treasury. And then you have to ask, are you gonna adjust it at all? This we're gonna use the implied approach. And then beta, you have the four step process. So that's what we're after here. So here we're talking, you know, I don't usually give you links of paper, but here you hear. Uh, easily one or two paragraphs. We'll talk about that. It used to be maybe a little bit more to that and maybe a graph. So that might be your entire 10 year treasury right there. So it shouldn't take up more than half of the first page, depending on how you do the graph. So it's, it's getting a lot easier. It was a lot harder when the 10 year treasury is at 0.5%, but now it's pretty normal. You just need to address the issue that the rate was low. On the implied approach, you have to say, you do have to explain that using expected return on stocks as a proxy or required return on stocks. So this does need a little bit more explanation. This isn't something that everybody knows. So or everybody's going to see, I'm using the implied approach. You're, you're going to have to most people probably know what the implied approach is, but not everybody uses that jargon. So you'd probably have to explain that some. And then the next obvious thing is the expected return on stocks equals current. Uh, let's say cash yield. We'll get into that. That's dividend plus buybacks. plus expected earnings growth. So you have, yeah, maybe a, a paragraph on that. What should a stock's, a stock's re expected return be? It should be what it, what's the current cash yield to the stockholders and then how fast do we expect your earnings to grow? Then expected earnings growth is a function of expected nominal GDP growth. And on both of these, I gave you a chart that you could use, and we'll look at those charts that you could use to, to back that up. And then expected nominal GDP growth equals expected productivity growth plus expected labor growth 
plus expected inflation. Now here's where you just see a lot of variety on paper. So I'll leave it up to you. How much do you want to go on to your assumptions for each one of these? One thing that's not allowed is looking at the last year and using that year as assumptions. Some students do that and say, oh yeah, eight, inflation has been 8%, so I'm going to use 8%. You're not going to use 8%. Our economy is not going to grow 12%. If they don't get inflation back down below five, you know, we got some serious problems. So a longer term perspective, but I gave you a chart for that, if you remember. So you have charts that somewhat support these back to history. So you have to decide how you come up with each one of those. <laughs> On expected inflation, that's the one where you, you could do a little work if you all wanted to do the, um, the forward curve. I have a video that shows you how to do the forward curve if you want to. You can see what inflation rate is price into the treasury markets. That's not a bad way to, to forecast it. But that's essentially what you're going to do there. So that's going to give you your expected return on stocks. And then the four set process, we already talked about that. So we'll, we'll go through that when we do this. So that's, so each one of those, that's probably a paragraph. That's probably a paragraph. That's probably, well, maybe these two is a paragraph. And then this is, who knows? I think we, I showed you one paper that could have gone on for 10 pages. Another student is two paragraphs. It just depends. It does, it's not necessarily the grades related to the number of pages, but you know, two paragraphs is probably way too short. 10 is probably 10 pages is probably overkill. So it's somewhere in between those two. Um, the, the key is that you justify your assumptions and, and you're com comfortable with those assumptions. All right. So let's, let's think about the risk-free. So the current tenure, we can get off of Yahoo Finance. I'm going to use Yahoo Finance. Four oh five. You can round if you want to. I would round if you know it's a four oh three. You might round it to four or four oh five. You don't have to be too precise. I'm actually not a big fan of. Uh, 4.0252 as if we have this kind of precision in finance <laughs> you know it's so 4.05 would be enough or even four percent would be fine i do think it's funny on cost of capital for most firms they go out like eight digits on the cost of debt and then cost of equity is like this it's like do you really need to go out that many decimal places so i used to joke with the accountants they call me for these numbers and i'd go out five or six decimals just a joke and I go, oh, just joking. He said, oh, yeah, that's funny. But what was what were the last four digits? I was like, I was just joking. You don't need the last four digits, but okay. <laughs> I like to make, I like the kid accountants. And then discussion, maybe something along the lines of has been a debated issue past few years with such a historically low. 10 year however now back to what could be considered more normal levels so current great works well without adjustment something like that does that make sense i wish i could That makes sense. So I would do it without adjustment. I don't really see a reason to adjust. The forward curve doesn't make sense now because the yield curve is inverted, which would give you a lower number. And I don't think you want a lower number. Any kind of normalizing you would do, you would, unless you really think they can't get inflation under control, you're, you're not going to come up with a number too much radically off of that. And then you might show a graph. So you do H15 in Google, and you can you can create a graph fairly quickly. 
I don't know why it's age 15. There's got to be some reason, but age 15 and you have historical data. You go to the their download. Go to download again. Download. I wish they would just have the download button on the very first page. And then when you bring that in, unfortunately, they have all the holidays in there. So you got to take the holidays out. You got to decide how far back in history you're going to go. Find the 10 year first. That's what I always do. So I can tell which column I want to have. So get rid of everything that's not 10 year. And let's see how far back we think we need to go. So you have to sort it. Get rid of bunch. I need to ask Keith Phillips why they put the holidays in all of their data and then sort it by date again. You saw that 0.5 there. That was the 2020 number. So, so how would you do it? You're trying to show that we're somewhat back to more normal levels. So you might actually put the median in. And the median is 5.7. That sounds pretty high. But that was also with the high rates in the 70s. Let's see what kind of graph we get. It might be too busy. We'll see. That's not a horrible graph, actually. And this really dominates that 5.7 without that in there. Now, do you want to go back to 1871? You can do that. He has it. He has it monthly. I think the issue I have going back to 1871 is I'm not so sure the U.S. wasn't an emerging country <laughs> in 1871. That I'm not sure it's the same risk back then as it is today. But if you look at it, he only goes through January, so it's pretty old data. But again, the, the 70s really stand out, don't they? <laughs> Whatever you do. So um, when you do that, 4% becomes a much more reasonable number. I don't, you don't see it here because he stopped, he stopped a little bit early. Now, if you want to update his numbers, it's a pain because he's using monthly. You'd have to actually get the average each month. He's not taking the ending number for each month. He's taking the average every month. So you have to go in for February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. For nine months, you have to get those months average. But you, you just take the average for the month if you want to update his chart. Why he hasn't updated it? Uh, recently, I don't know. You can see it somewhat here, same chart. Um, does that seem overkill? Go back that far? Yeah, it seems a little much, but. And label it, put dates in there, all that kind of stuff. So this is not very well done, but label it. But this is, if you look historically, this is a fairly historic rise, pretty dramatic rise. Very quickly, there's not too many times where you see that kind of just radical, radical rise in the numbers. So actually, I should, I should clean it up quite a bit. You know, get rid of white space. You don't need you don't need white space on these charts. Put the dates in. Ah, I always do that, don't I? Ah. One of these days, I'll teach a class, and you see why it's hard to think while you're talking.
Okay, so it's a better looking, better looking chart. Well, entitle it in your injury. So as you can see from the chart, we're back to more normal levels, not up to the median for the period, but the median period is somewhat skewed for high inflation of the 70s. Therefore, I think 405 is, like perfect, you know, that kind of discussion. Two paragraphs, some of y'all might be four, some of y'all like to really explain stuff, which is fine, uh, but. All right, questions on the recipe rate. Does that seem pretty straightforward? So this is one, you, you know, if you wrote the paper in my investment class, you probably can't use what you did there because interest rates were a lot, lot lower back then. So, All right, market risk premium. So stock expected return. You've got a little bit of history there that I gave y'all. I see where I put it because I'm always a little bit unsure. I either put it under templates. Yes, it's under templates. So class models and templates. It says papers five and six. It should say what? Papers four and five, shouldn't it? I didn't cut a paper out of your class. I just combined the first two papers into one. So that's the reason. So don't think like, wow, he, he, he reduced the work for us. Like, I never do that. So <laughs> So this one shows you that stocks do make earnings yield plus expected earnings growth. I realize it got a little bit away, so you know you have to, you may have to put a little words. If you look at this chart, you can see when you map the actual stock return against each decade's dividend yield plus earnings growth, the stock market tracks it very closely, except for recently where it's gotten uh, well above the trend. However, I believe, you know, something along those lines, if you want to put this chart into your paper. I do think it makes a strong case. Now, I've never shown this outside of a class, but this, this sim room speaking at an actual conference, and I'm going to show them this chart and they're all a whole lot smarter than I am. So they're maybe not as smart as y'all are, but y'all don't have their their courage to uh, disagree with the professor. So uh, it'd be interesting to hear what their comments are. It's that PNC actuaries. So it's usually kind of a mixed group. Sometimes they're mean, sometimes they're nice. All right, then the next one is just looking at earnings growth. Expected earnings growth equal GDP. So that one you've got a, I think a very strong chart for that, especially given that since for the last 70 years, the two are almost exactly the same, 641 and 647. I think at a minimum, this chart says you can't expect corporate earnings growth to be a lot faster than the economy. It's been, you know, this is the best it's ever been catching up with the economy. And even then it's a few points lower. So I don't think you can say, hey, and it doesn't make sense for corporate earnings to grow faster than the economy in an appreciable way. Otherwise, you run out of, you run out of economy, it just takes over the economy. I was watching a 
a podcast, listening to a podcast or something, something I was listening to where they, they were making that exact same point. I can't remember who it was. So, um, you know, you're, it's not like I'm radical here. It's people will say that corporate earnings has to be a fairly constant percentage of the economy and then expected GDP growth. One last chart for that one. So most students do use these charts in the paper, which is perfectly fine. Or you can create your own if you want to do a little extra you know, analysis and come with your own thing. But if you're going to use my philosophy, you certainly have that. So here, it's a few paragraphs or many, many paragraphs. You could easily write three or four paragraphs on productivity, a couple of paragraphs on labor. Inflation is probably the easiest one because I mean the easiest thing to do is use the forward curve because there you, you got a really good forecast. What you can do for inflation is just use history, at least not recent history. You could lose long, long, long term history. But if long, long term history is 3.7 percent and the Fed says they're still shooting for two, you know, it's it's hard. You got so make it rational, reasonable. So here you you actually are setting up the theory. One reason I really want you to do this is this is a great discussion to have in an interview. Talk about you know how you come up with your assumption for stocks, the market risk premium. It's, it's you know supposedly the most important number in finance. It'd be good to have a really good lengthy discussion on on what this means. So what is the implied approach? Where are you can get your assumptions from? So those two, and then what are your assumptions, All right? So for me, I'm going to say productivity growth. Maybe I'll say two and a half percent. There is pent, pent up innovations nearing release. I think you know, dramatically through productivity that's my belief you might not believe like product hopefully you can spell better than i do such as or productivity has been weak lately. I think we'll get the historical medians around 2%. You know, whatever you got to give me your opinion. So whatever you think, if you voted for Yang for president, and you know his website has a lot of stuff on productivity, you could go see what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Huh? So what about the uh, uh, five-year forward inflation? What? The five-year uh, forward inflation. Yeah, the five-year forward inflation. I'll do it right now, just so you can see it. Let me do uh, labor growth. I'm going to put 0.5% there. Is has been weak lately and expect baby boomers retire, but should benefit. However, you want to, I mean, these are again my opinion, benefit from. Immigration reform eventually, just because we have no choice. Not that politicians are going to really be good at working at it. 
So it's hard to make the argument baby boomers retiring, so we're going to stop working, we'll be replaced with robots. We'll have to replace U.S. citizens with immigrants. We have almost no choice with that. The, the question is how will Congress actually set that up? Um, but that's one approach. If you look at the actual history, um, it's um, the last two decades together, you're getting like maybe half a percent growth. So that's somewhat consistent with the last decade. Longer term, it's been one and a half percent. I I doubt you could argue argue one and a half percent because that one and a half percent includes a lot of women joining the workforce in the 60s and 70s. And it's hard to think we're going to have that happen again unless we go back to child labor for some reason. So there's not really another group to add other than immigrants. We do have a huge advantage that we do. We do have some some good skilled workers in higher population areas that are pretty close to the U.S. So that has given us a little bit of an advantage. Um, but that's a tough one. Some people link the two, high productivity with low labor growth because we're going to replace labor with, with robots and AI, you know, however you argue it. Um, just put some rational thought into it. Let be your own thought. What do you think? This is, this is really key to being a stock investor. You don't want to be a stock investor if economies aren't growing. It's just not going to work. So you better hope the U.S. economy grows 4 to 6%. Uh, and you hope that that four to six percent is not coming all from inflation. Then on inflation, let's try the forward break even inflation. I'll do it real quick, but you can watch my video. So on this, what you need is you need the 10 year treasury, you need the five year treasury, you need the nominal, and you need the tips. And so you can just type treasury yield curve. And it comes up here and you have a selection. So you can just, you can just spell not that one, sorry. Um, I don't think this is it either. Ah, where's the side I've been using? Okay, there it is. So it's this one, hometreasury.gov, hometreasury.gov, U.S. Department of Treasury. So we want the, let's try this one first. So the 10-year, this is as last Friday, 10-year is 410. Five years, actually even higher. Five years, one, two, three, four, five. It's easy, one, two, three, four, five, 427. And then tips. So they have daily treasury real long-term rates. And nothing happens. Oh, current month. I can't do current month, can I? <laughs> I forgot it's November 1st. All right. So, oh, it's just a 10 year. How do we get the entire curve here? All right. So, you might just throw in the tile and do current tip yields. And keep clicking until you find it. I saw it the other day, so I know it's it's there. It's ten year. Probably the same thing. I don't know why I'm let's see.
I don't know why this just gives me the tenure. I mean, we need the tenure, right? The tenure is 186, but boy, we need the five year too. I had a website just the other day and it came right up when I typed current tip yields. Five year tips expected, five year tip yield. It goes through November, where is October 31st? There, there it is, 158. It used to be, let me show you, there's probably a better site here. If you do the H15, I should have done that. If you do the H15 and just do selected interest rates, yeah, I should have started here. If you do selected interest rates, it's right here. There's October 31st. There's the 10 year 410. There's the five, five year 427. Here's the tips. So it's, I take everything back. I just said 158 and 160. So yeah, I, sorry, I put you on a wild goose chase there. So they still do have this page. If you do H15 and just do the selected rates, they, they will show you this, the current rates. They don't do as much as they used to. They used to report um, mortgage rates. They used to report some corporate rates. They've taken a lot of those away. And in fact, corporate rates are really low because you could go back even further than treasuries, like in the early 20s, for some reason they destroyed all that and you don't have it access to any, I, I guess they just got tired of getting the numbers. But y'all see how we did that. There's October 31st. Constant maturity is all your nominals and inflation. There's your inflation. So you just need the 10 year 410, the five year 427, the 10 year 158, the five year 160. Then you do the forward rate. So the forward rate, what you do is one plus the 10, raised to the 10, divided by one plus the five, raised to the five. All of that raised to the one divided by five minus one. Have y'all done this before? Maybe in one of my other classes. So it, it's good to know. And, You know, as you get a question in in an interview, where do you think interest rates are going? Where do you think inflation is going? You, you'd say, hey, I, I just go with the people's skin in the game. I use the forward curve. That's going to sound like a pretty astute. Why would I know more? How, why would I know more than, you know, the bond investors out there? All right. So what it's saying is. I have one parenthesis. What we're trying to do is find out what the five year treasury will be in five years. So we want to know, we want to be completely indifferent. We have two choices. We can buy a 10 year today, or we can buy a five year today. Then at maturity, do what? Reinvest in another five year. So what are we asking? What will that five year treasury have to be? This one right here. What does it have to be so you're indifferent between those two strategies? But by the 10 year, I know exactly what for five years. But by the five years, I don't know why I'm going to reinvest that, but what rate would that need to be so I'm indifferent between the two? If I think the five years can be higher than that, then I would buy the five year and reinvest in five. I think the five years can be lower than that, I buy the 10 year and just lock in my rates. So it gives you, and you can actually make this investment today. That's the cool thing. If you think five year treasury can be higher than this shows, then you can buy the five year short to 10 year. No cash invested, and you win if you're right. The five years higher than your ten-year treasury is going to be worth less because you have a higher discount rate. So yeah, it's 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 a great way to, um, to actually forecast interest rates. So one plus the ten-year raised to the ten divided by one plus. And I may have my parentheses off, so forgive me if I do that. Take all of that and raise it to the one, divided by 10 minus five, minus one. We'll know if it's the right answer. The answer we should get is probably 380 something, I don't know, or 
wait, why is it higher? Did I do it wrong? Let, let's try it. I did something wrong. So it's probably a parentheses problem. Dot raised to the 10. Raised to, ah, no, that's right. 10 minus 5. 1 plus the 10 year raised to the 10. So I need to bring all this in again. That looks better. All right. So that makes more sense. You know, it's not going to be 43%. It's if the five years is higher, then it has to be lower. Because what that means, you're going to invest at 427 for five years and invest at some other rate that you end up at 410 the whole time. So obviously, if you start at 427, you'd have to invest at 390 something. So you end up with 410 the whole time. Usually the five year is lower than the 10. So the forward rate is higher, but here it's actually lower. We can do the same thing with the tips. One plus the 10 year, raise it to 10, divided by one plus the five year, raise it to five. We're gonna take all of that and raise it to one divided by 10 minus five minus one. That looks right, 156. So the break even. If you just take the Ford minus the Ford, and it gives you 237. So right now, the bond market is saying inflation will be about 237 five years from now. They think the 10 year, will, the five year will be 396, I mean, 390, 393 in five years. The tip yield for the five year will be 1.56 in five years. And inflation will be 2.37 in five years. Obviously, much lower than my current inflation is. Now, if you do just the five year, you get a higher number. If you do the five year treasury, today's numbers, that's not a forward curve. That's just today's. You get 267. That's essentially the break even over the next five years. But we like to get past the noise, what's going on in markets, and, and use a more future number, 237. You could use this rate, just take the five year, or you even could use the 10 year. Using the 10 year trips, tips versus a nominal, you subtract them and that implies what inflation is. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a parentheses problem, isn't it? Just keep adding parentheses until the color changes to the right color. That's what I usually do. All right, you don't have to do this, but it's great to put in a paper because it looks, if you're interviewing with an HR person, it looks really sophisticated. Um, and there's a lot of finance people that don't know how to do this. I've told this story so many times so you are sick of hearing it, but anyway, and it's still sitting at my desk and the CEO of USA calls me, Ron, I'm in a room with all these finance and accounting people. They don't know how to do the forward curve. Can you show them how? And it's like, I'm, Glad I just taken the CFA exam. I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I would have said, yeah, I can do that if I didn't know what I was doing, but I would have been Googling really fast while he was talking. Um, but yeah, there was a room full of an accountant. It's not finance people, and none of them had any clue what the Ford curve was. So it is it is a good, powerful little tool to have because when it comes up, it's easy. But make sure you understand it. So I'm Tamara, I'm glad you asked that question. You want to be able to explain it. You're it's an indifference number. You're in difference between paying, buying a 10 year or buying the five year and then reinvesting at this rate gives you the same result. Now, there is some debate on the break even inflation. The guy I got this from, he thinks there's actually a risk premium. He actually is more, he says it's more risky to buy the 10 year than the five inflation takes off because you're stuck. So he says when people do the 10 year, they're, they're actually asking for an inflation premiums. And he thought it was as high as 25, 50 basis points. You don't need to make that adjustment. Just, you know, he's, he's an economist, a lot smarter than I am, but he showed it at, he showed this whole thing at a conference and I started doing it immediately because it, it just makes a lot of sense. I like, I like forecasts where the people doing the forecasts have skin in the game and that's the bond market. 
I don't, when economists make forecasts and they're wrong, no one cares. And they, they bear no brunt for being wrong. But a bond investor, if they're wrong, they, they lose money. So they have, to, they have to get this somewhat respectable. All right, so that's a good approach. You, you can say Fed is saying whatever. That's been the big question. Are they are they targeting inflation two percent or below? Are they targeting an average two percent inflation? If they're targeting an average two percent inflation, still a little rough, but at least they got a lot of really low inflation numbers to work into their average until this year. I think this year destroys even that argument. There are people arguing to monetize the debt. What y'all did cover that in money and banking? I remember that for you from money money and banking monetize the debt drive inflation up so government debt just falls in, in current dollars great for um, um borrowers horrible for savers so there are people arguing that the fed should let inflation go to a higher three four five percent the economist has had some articles on that so we let inflation jump up to three four five percent is that because it's a better answer or because it makes the Fed's job easier to get things back under control? Who knows what's going on? So what's the Fed saying? I don't know if you can Google that or not. I'd ask Juan Carlos, but he's not our economist anymore. So Here's something September 2nd. Over the years, the 2% inflation target has become an international standard across central banks. The Fed's record. There's the PCE, if you want to you know, get more sophisticated. That's supposedly their official number. That looks like an interesting article right there. 2022 kind of stands out a little bit. There's their target. Again, we don't know what the target means. That means if they want exactly 2% inflation. They want 2% or less. They want the average 2%. This one, someone implies I want an average of 2%, but which is easy when you have numbers like this to help bring the average down really hard when you have numbers like that. Yeah, that's a good article. I almost want to stop and read it. But I don't know who wrote it. Carlos, you wrote this. Well, uh, yeah. I don't know that fake last name. Yes. But you can Google things like that and you know put some strength to your paper, quote somebody. <laughs> Uh huh. Example here is um, calculating the forward inflation rate of this country. And they, they use similar numbers, but they did the thing. Mm -hmm. sure I don't know. You have to send it to me. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Um, I'm not adjusting for the fact that these pay twice a year. And some might do that. That gives you the effective rate. So are they getting similar numbers, but slightly off, like a couple of basis points? Um, no. No. No, it's different. The answer. The answer is radically different. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. What is their forward rate? Well, they did not do that. They 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 did something completely different. Well, they they yeah, the forward rate was very close to this, but they did the break even. They just did it in a different manner. Where they did oh, this break even here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this from an economist that presented us at the conference was work for the Federal Reserve. He seemed to be a pretty sharp guy. I even called him after the conference. He hated it. I called him. He was pretty upset that I called him, but he still answered my questions. But um, I mean, he knew he knew Bernanke by on a first name basis, which impressed me unless he was lying at the conference. But um, he was telling me all these stories about Bernanke and Greenspan's love life. But that was really interesting. So he seemed to be official. He could have been a complete. <laughs> but this way, we've always done it. Yeah, I'd be interested if there's another approach. So the forward curves are doing the same. It's just the break even is different. Yeah. OK. I and mean, there may be some adjustment where the, these two things actually, there's a, co a correlation between the two that they may be adjusting for. But I doubt you can, if you're not going to get a radically different answer, I doubt. Because even though you get 237, you're probably going to round that to two and a half or something like that anyway. So, you know, you get close. 
So inflation, let's use two and a half percent. And so that gives me nominal GDP, uh, 2.5 plus 0.5 plus 2.5, that gives me 5.5. I think anything 4% to 6% is reasonable. And I say that because if you get below 4%, it's going to give you really horrible valuations. If you get above 6%, you're getting you're you're, you're getting into uh, I don't know good just pure random just hope hope world I guess I don't know what world to say I know President Trump talked about those kind of numbers. Um, I think he was saying five percent for real GDP, which would have been a seven percent. Although people are really confused if he's talking about real or nominal. Um, I don't see how you can get above 6% unless you have really high, high inflation. So historically, we've been 6 but that's been with some pretty, you know, 1.5% labor growth. The last couple, we hit 6% in the 90s, but the last couple of decades, we haven't hit 5%. So you'd have to have some radical view going forward. And I think you'd have to have a radical view to get the six. <laughs> um, I was reading the economist. There's a book that the economist talked about that I really want to get. But it's, there's this argument that we're at the end of the line on productivity. We just can't. We've run out of ideas. It's kind of the Apple debate. You think about Apple as a corporation. It's net, it's market cap is two and a half trillion dollars. It's like there's just no way a firm that big can grow very fast. It's kind of the same thing. We've got so much knowledge, it's hard for the next knowledge to really be all that added to the previous because we just know so much. But we've said that before. I think they probably were saying that in the 1400s too. So, you know, who knows if that's true. But there, there's a lot of debate about this whole productivity thing. Is it really dying? Because you've noticed, I mean, this has been horrible here recently. And this is a global phenomenon. Why is productivity coming down? China seeing the same thing. It's really been an issue. Is there something fundamentally different about productivity going forward? You're certainly not going to get a very good GDP if productivity is only 1%. We're going to be much poorer people. Um, and you saw what it is this year. We saw that last class. So five and a half actually seems a little high to me, but I'll, I'll go with five and a half. So I got five and a half nominal GDP, four and a half real rate. And then we got the dividend yield. Here I just get the SPY. And I, I bet it's come up quite a bit here. Market's tanking. So the current, yeah, yeah, it's back up above one and a half. So 1.73%. I recommend rounding numbers. I really do. It just, it just makes more sense. And then the buyback. I'm going to use 1%. And here you probably need to reference the article. Quickly, I don't need anything extensive, but reference the article there. You don't need a no reference here. Just use. SPY. You don't have to say where you got it from. You can just say the current dividend yield on the S&P 500 is 1.75%, about 1.75%. According to an article from Roger Ibbotson et al., we need to add anywhere from 1% to 1.5% for buyback yield because companies have been doing significant buybacks. His article really argues more one and a half, but And so then you get an expected return on stocks. Uh, dividend yield, buyback yield, means growth.
make 25. I think 6.5% to 9% is a reasonable range. <clears throat> now, you can use Damo Darren as a reference if you like. He's pretty easy to reference because everything he does, he puts on the internet. I could probably find the first and last name of all of his kids out there because he puts everything out there. So let's let's calculate. Let's calculate our market risk premium. So our market risk premium is expected stocks and risk free rate. So expected return on stocks is that risk free rate that so the market risk premium is 420. Let's see how close that is to his numbers. Let's see what titles we have here. ERP, smooth, normalized, he's got a bunch of them. So expected growth rate. Well, we need some titles in here, don't we? Seven twenty-two expected growth rate. He's using seven seventy-nine. What did we use? Five fifty, so we're well below him. But if you look longer term, look at the numbers just not too long ago. And why is this number so much higher? Because he relies heavily on the the ten year treasury for his assumptions. I mean, do you really buy the thirteen twenty? Seems a little far weird. But his his equity premium, he's got five forty two. We got 420, but if you look back historically, I keep going the wrong spot. Historically, he was in the fours not too long ago. You can see somewhat of the issue that he has and the way he brings in interest rates and inflation. It gives him some volatility he hasn't seen before. So there's plenty of stuff out there that he has that you can certainly use. I like the I like to like the graph he uses. I don't know if he has it in any of these papers. Yeah, so he he's he's a guru. You can certainly use his numbers if you want to as backup. This is somewhat. Lower than expect our forecast. Darren, but reasonable is a recent estimate, something like that. If you want to put a chart in with his, you can certainly do that. This gives you more strength to say that, hey, you know, I didn't just do this blindly. I went out and looked at others. And he is somewhat the guru. It used to be Ibbotson, now it's Damodaran. And the nice thing about him is he updates everything pretty regularly and sticks it out there for free. You know, you get all that for free from him. <clears throat> Market risk premium below four, you're getting a little stretched. It's getting low right now because uh, the risk free rate's getting higher. If the risk free rate gets up to six or seven, you're going to get a pretty thin. Now, 
What you'll notice is the expected return on stocks doesn't change because the risk-free rate changes. What changes the market risk premium? So it's always really important to ask, why does it matter? So be real careful here. Some of you say, well, higher risk-free rate, we get a smaller market risk premium. Well, if your beta is one, what difference does it make? Makes no difference whatsoever. What's your discount rate if your beta is one? It's 825 every single time. <laughs> Market risk premium can go all over the place as long as your beta is one. If beta is greater than one, a higher market risk premium will increase discount rate and reduce values. So the higher market risk premium, the more you're disadvantaging high beta stocks, the more you're advantaging low beta stocks. So that's really where this comes down to. Your discount rate for the stock market is 825. The question is how much are you going to penalize high beta stocks? So if you use this approach before where you use 8%, but the risk free rate was 0.05, if you use a market risk premium of 775, you're really penalizing high beta stocks and you're really benefiting low beta stocks. So that's the key. So you're not really affecting anything other than, you know, especially if your stock's around beta one, it doesn't really matter. You're going through a lot of work. Kind of brings up the question why is this number considered the most important number in finance? It seems like this is the most important number in finance. And I really think that's what they mean when they say the most important number in finance. Because they they say it affects the discount rate, but it, really when you're discount when you're discounting the stock to value of stocks, you're going to use the 825. All right. So you see, there's a little discussion you could put in here if you'd like to, uh, how much you want to document your beliefs. All right. So that's a couple of pages in your paper, maybe three or four or five. Five would be probably a little much. One would be too little. All right, questions up to that point. Y'all feel comfortable with that? All right, so now let's do beta and we're gonna do Walmart. So step one is revenue sensitivity. Definitely a consumer stable low beta stock. Uh huh. Well, there's a big debate. Well, there's been a big debate about the risk-free rate. Do we adjust it? Do we use the actual number? Do we normalize it? But our expected return on stocks, if you look at Dr. Demer, Darren, his expected return on stocks doesn't change dramatically over time. It has this year because of inflation, but it's been fairly consistently around eight. What's changed is this market risk premium. Why is it changed? Because the risk-free rate keeps going like that. So your discount rate, if your beta is one, your discount rate is 825, no matter what your market risk premium does. This thing can move all over the place. If your beta is one, you get 825. If you add 6% plus one times two, you get eight. You take 2% times one times six, you get eight. You get the same number every, every time. So I think we sometimes forget all of this we're going through really is important if your beta is significantly away from one. If it's not significantly from one, it's a little bit of an academic discussion. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, so, do we only take the past twelve months for the buyback? No, you, that's why I'm referencing the article, which is several years old. Five years. Well, you can't actually calculate this number, so there's no place to go get this number. So, all you only offer, only thing you have is this article, which is several years old. I mean, you, you really can't. I mean, if you saw the article, they they went through quite a bit of contortions to get get their their numbers. It's so really no, no, no. You don't use your firm. All right, good question. None of these have anything to do with your firm. This is not your firm's buyback yield. It's the stock market's buyback yield. Yeah, you can't use your own firms. I've been meaning to get on Bloomberg and see if buybacks have materially changed in the last ten years. I think that'd be interesting if I if I can get that done. Uh, I'll. I'll let y'all know if there has been any major change. 
But no, you're stuck with an article that's pretty link, pretty long, written pretty long ago. Um, yeah, good point. Dividend yield is the dividend yield of the stock market, buyback yield of the stock market, earnings growth of the stock market. None of these have anything to do with your stock whatsoever. All right, so Walmart, definitely a consumer staple. Now, I might, some students do this, might discuss two last crises because that might give you some insight. So Walmart excelled in both 2008 and March in 2020. They did extremely well in both of those times. 2008, they were one of the few companies that whose stocks used had a really strong positive return. Everybody else, very, very negative returns. Most most other companies, very negative returns. 2008, yeah, they had some negative numbers early on when the whole world was freaking out, but they ended up actually benefiting from COVID. So they had, I don't know how to spell the word Excel, but does it have two L's? But whatever that is, but... So you might discuss that. Some students, because you have 2008 and 2020, you have something somewhat recent. You have to be careful with that because there is a lot of noise with these numbers. It could be that they did well in 2008 because they announced something major that had really nothing to do with systematic risk entirely related to Walmart. Um, I think Zoom did well in 2020, but that's not because they're a low beta stock. It's because 2020 was a very unique crisis that they just happened to benefit from. That's that's more unsystematic type of analysis than it is systematic. Unless you think every crisis in the future is going to be a pandemic, then you really can't use 2020 for Zoom to say that's going to be the case going forward. But you might. There are some things you can talk here. You don't have to go back and do a regression. I've seen students do the do a regression of their revenues to the to the economy. I, I think that's there's a lot of noise in accounting figures like that. There's a lot of noise in GDP. I don't. I mean, you can try it, but I don't think you're going to find um, a, a, a good statistical analysis there. You could basically say revenue percentage change versus economic activity high level if you wanted to. Just in a general sense. So for example, you say Walmart, Walmart's going to do well because it's low cost. When people are, are scared about their jobs, they'll go, for example, in 2008, the stock did extremely well when most other stocks were down as it was the place people went, you know, whatever, you know, put it in words. And then you don't, you're not statistically saying 2008 proves are low beta. You're essentially giving that as an example of your theory and you're just, you know, you put it in to give some, some power to it. Step two. And three, let's just do two. Operating leverage. Here, students lose points because they don't do the subjective. You need to have the subjective statement in there. So Walmart, heavy, hourly workers, mix, expenses, or variable very um well prices can rise and fall with cost of goods sold as uh customers expect that if people know banana prices are going up they don't they don't blame Walmart when they go to the store. No, I mean, rarely. I mean, there may be people like that. Like, Walmart, man, you, you charged a dollar last year. Now it's a dollar fifty. What are you doing to me? But no, most people understand. Yeah, prices are up. It's, they kind of know they got to pay whatever is there. So some subjective. They do have many stores. So some significant depreciation but not enough to offset variable labor or whatever so you know i i think believe they have low 
average fixed cost your expenses. Something along those lines. You know, subjectively talk about it. Do you have a heavy union labor? Do you have uh, heavy CapEx, heavy research and development costs? Do you have salary workers that are very high paid professional workers? Is there a um, a key for wrap text? I mean, no. Yes. Control all patients. HMC? Yeah. You can control all and then HMC. Okay, I'll have to try it. Okay. And then you use the uh, the beta file. I mean, the um, the file for beta Excel. Yeah, I remember that from last class. So you just load that file and just you just do that that particular math. So remember when you do this file, it's really important because the file's so massive. I've already got Walmart set up, but find your company first. So if you're doing Costco, type the word cost, make sure you actually have Costco because there's a couple of places called cost. So 667, find your company 667 and just change it to 667. Otherwise, if you do equal and go try to find it, you got 3000 rows you got to go through and it's just some pain. So we look at them. You can leave the gross margin out if you can. I just find it interesting to see, but the net margin is what you need. So. You can clean it up before you put it in your paper. Walmart has a very stable net margin, 0.72% standard deviation versus typical stocks, 7.4%. Consistent with my assumption below average. Now, what could you do to strengthen your paper? Suggest bringing in more competitors and just seeing where they are. We know Costco is very low. Progress is very low. I don't know about Kohl's. We could see if Kohl's, you know, you could bring in Target and Kohl's and just see. 2657. Very, very low as well. We knew Costco is low, Kohl's. Um, Fifteen sixty four, a little bit higher, but still well below average, which kind of makes sense that, that would be the case. Um, Nordstrom, eighteen sixty seven. Yeah, above average. So that's interesting. More is above average, more volatile. They're hourly workers, though, right? Aren't they? Or are they salaried? No. They, yeah, the commission you would think would be a variable cost, but it sounds like it's, well, I don't know. So, you know, that's interesting. Nordstrom's actually higher. Their gross margin's pretty tame, but their net margin's pretty volatile. Um, Right, so you might bring in some other com some more competitors because what you want to ask 
you're trying to figure out is this company specific or specific or industry thing? That's what you're trying to figure out. Wow, Walmart has a very stable net margins, but there's something unusual they're doing or is a whole industry like that? And that gives you the way to answer it by bringing four or five companies and saying, yeah, they're, this is the industry thing, but Walmart's well on the low end of this volatility. Not as low as Costco, but pretty low. R, it's an industry thing. Walmart's actually on the higher end, but they are lower than the average stock, but not lower than their average in the industry, that kind of thing. All right, so you do need to have some discussion on offering leverage. Don't just use the Excel file. Step three, is just financial leverage. That one is, I, I let you get away pretty easy on that one. Just, just bring in, that's not Nordstrom, is it? Did I get the wrong company? It is. Ah, maybe. <laughs> I was thinking, wow, okay. That's always good to have a discussion about the wrong company. Ah, there it makes more sense. So they are higher, but they're not above average. So that makes sense. So you notice as we got from discount to full cost, that volatility gets higher. That makes some sense. Yeah, that that's good. That makes me feel better. It didn't make a lot of sense. Um, all right. So twenty nine sixty three. So you just have to bring that one chart in and talk about it. You might reference back to paper three if it's been a recent phenomenon that their debt just recently shot up or whatever. This is another one where you could bring in some industry numbers. But All right, so I'll finish this up next class, but we're getting pretty close to paper four done. Then we'll do six. Six will be faster next class. So you'll have a video you can walk through. So, all right, I'll leave it there. All right, let's get started. All right, so we're getting we're getting close to our, our beta here. We just got to do the rolling. Um, Tamara talked about a different formula on the Ford break even inflation. So essentially, what they did. I calculated the four to the nominal, the four to the tips, and then I took the difference. They took the difference of the nominal tip, nominal tip, and then they did the four of that. So it's, it's, it gets, I got the same number. I think Tamara, you said you got the same number now too. So you get the same number. So it's just, I like to do this because I want to know what the forward rate is, the forward real rate and the forward uh, nominal rate, and then the difference is inflation. Or you can take the difference and Essentially, that's what inflation will be uh, over the next 10 years, what inflation will be over the next five years, and so what will inflation be five years from now? You get the exact same answer, so either approach works. Um, all right, so the last thing we were doing, we were talking about beta. So you have a discussion about the firm. What kind of firm is it? You can go into more discussion. I was looking at Tamar's paper. He, he talks... You know, he's got a little bit of a strange company because they do aerospace and defense. Defense is traditionally a low beta industry because governments tend to spend more during recessions than other times. Uh, but aerospace is definitely a high beta. So he's trying to address how to how to adjust those two things. Now, if you listen to Dr. Damadaran, he, talk, he talks about built up beta, where you take a beta for each segment of the business and build it all up. But boy, that's really tough to do. It's hard to say break up Disney into its pieces and say, okay, the the cruise line has this beta, the theme parks have this beta, the movies have this. Beta. It's just a tough thing to do. So we said Disney is definitely a a staple. Their um, margins are very, very, very stable, as you would expect. Their debt's a little high, but not much. And so the last thing we could do is is the history. I don't think that's how history is spelled. It's a little better. So what I have here is, 
me save it as Walmart so I don't. So I brought in Walmart and I brought in Target. So I do recommend that you bring in two. Now, he's a student built this wonderful website for me where you could bring in the rolling betas of multiple companies at once. You just have to put their tickers in. But he wrote it in Python and switched it to SQL or something, the whole thing. And he, he did it for free. So it's not like I have any ability to have him update it. He sent me the Python program, but I haven't had time to look at it. So I don't know if I can figure it out and see how to do it. But it's actually pretty cool. But here I just brought in the S&P 500, Walmart, and Target. Brought in the getting their returns. And then here's their rolling, their rolling betas. There's Walmart versus the S&P 500. Walmart's in F, S&P's in E, and then there's Target. And then do the 10 percentile for Walmart. Walmart's going to be one of those that's going to have two histories. So I'll probably change that. So there's the 10 percentile, 0.24. That may seem really, really low. There's the 0.9 percentile, 1.21. And then the medium, 0.56. So the first thing I want to do is just look at Walmart versus Target and see how different they are. We, we expect Walmart to be lower than Target. And sure enough, it is for most of that period. That makes sense. Target ranges around the one. Target is one of those kind of like McDonald's kind of on the cusp of a one to slightly high. It's not necessarily a staple. And then Walmart has come down, in fact, gone negative at some points. But. Uh, much, much, much lower consistently. So that makes sense that they would be lower. And then the other thing we can do is look at them versus their their averages or their, their range. And you can see that their median is right around 0. 0.6, which seems low to me. They've been much slower, especially when you get the 2008 crisis, and this is probably COVID, or maybe that's COVID. It, it, you know, you could certainly make an argument, Walmart beta goes negative during a massive crisis, which is exactly when you want a stock to go negative beta. That'd be the best. So maybe you could argue Walmart is almost a risk-free company. I, I had trouble just saying that. But essentially what we're gonna do here, we'll look at this range. This range is really wide, but that's because of these years, if you come down here, you're looking somewhere in the 0.2 to 0.8, which still seems too low to me. So history range suggests point 0.2, point 0.8 with median at 0.6. 0 0.2 is way too low from my opinion. I don't, I don't normally go below 0.4. I don't even know if I go below 0.4 on a gold stock, but grocery stores, I can get down to 0.4, but I don't I don't think a Walmart is being as staple as a grocery store. They do have a lot of groceries, but they also sell flat screen TVs and some other things, gardening. Um, so again, at the very end of this section, you're gonna have your summary. So you have revenue sensitivity, Op leverage, financial leverage, and history. And so you're going to have a base of best. You can go worst, best. Right? Let's do worst to best. That makes more sense, maybe, and best. And if you want to, you can even have a comment section. By doing this, you force yourself to make sure you comment on all of these and you don't just talk history. So 
My base, I'm, I'm going to say I, I do think they are points. I, I used to almost always have Walmart at point seven. They've certainly proven themselves to be a good protector. Worst case, you want the highest number you have. So I'm going to do the point eight. Point five is probably the lowest I can go here. Definitely a staple and have proven to be especially diversifying last two crises. You know, just something in there to gives you some argument for why you want to load a low discount rate because that's going to argue for a high valuation. Now someone say, yeah, but they got competition with with uh, Amazon and there's all these threats with all that unsystematic risk. We're looking at them as a systematic risk. Operating leverage, um, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, very low ball margins. Very predictable, which gives you some sense that management manages to margin. It's something they watch and they keep it in that high range, which you expect when you have a thin margin business, they better be really good at keeping that business very stable and the stock market loves that. So financial leverage, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.6, maybe something like that. That's probably a little much. It wasn't that high. So slightly above average. Yeah. And then history again, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And then final recommendation. Right, So I, I'm going to go with 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 0.4. And you, you finish up. You have your risk-free. What did we say our risk-free was? 405. Has that changed? <laughs> it's a little bit higher, isn't it? My next buy point, I think, is four. Where is my next buy point? On bonds, I've been kicking out durations slowly over time. I don't think we're close because we actually had a rally there. Um, oh, 434, so not even close. We're at 412. So yeah, we got up to my last buy point, which is four. I think my last buy point like, like 420 something, but I was on my bike, so I couldn't trade. And the next day, it, it shot up to 430 something. So I actually kind of was glad I was on the bike. But so we'll keep it at 405. Our market risk premium we said was what? 420. So our KE cost equity capital is going to be all right. Y'all know this formula, right? Someone give me the formula. Most important formula. Just I always assume everybody knows it, but y'all y'all tell me. Come on, Juan Carlos. Risk all right. I tell you, I was taking the CFA exam and two guys in front of me on the last day of the review. What's this cap in thing? <laughs> what was that formula? Second, I think I'm going to do well on the exam. Yeah, it's the most important formula in finance. It's just as far as being quoted and referenced a lot. 657. So let's think about that. Over the next 10, 20 years, if you got a 6.57% return on Walmart stock. Would that make you happy that you got your risk covered? Seems low. Historically, you know, stocks have had a much higher return, at least during my my career. 
741, I'd be really happy about that. That sounds pretty good for a Walmart. 573, the problem with 573 for me, I can't show it to you, but I can buy some double B bonds paying seven, eight percent. Um, those are companies that have a you know 10, 15 percent chance of insolvency over the next 10 years, but I can get eight, nine percent, seven, eight, nine percent. Not so sure on that. I can probably buy some municipal bonds paying four percent and or tax free. So after tax, I can almost buy municipal bonds and get the same after tax return. So I don't know, 573 seems awfully low to me. What's the other issue that we have here? Y'all remember this? What do you have to watch out here? You remember this? Long-term growth. What's the highest your long-term growth can be? Can't be 6%. Your long-term growth 6%, Walmart's worth infinity. So your discount rate limits your long-term growth. Your long-term growth cannot be higher than that number. So if you end up with a 4%, like if I use a uh, 0.2 beta and my growth room is 5%, it's just not going to work. I have had students put a negative valuation in their paper. It always shocked me. Oh. See, and they go through the whole thing. You know, it's, it's the thing where students are being students and not stepping back and saying, hey, what am I writing here? So I kind of understand it. you guys are stressed out. But still, it just seems strange to say, yeah, I got negative $500. That's much lower than my current valuation. I, I, I think it's not. A, it's like, no, it's your valuation is infinity. It's much higher than your current valuation. So, so be careful there. Your short-term growth can be higher than that. So your short-term growth rate can be 20, 30, 40%. It's just your long-term growth rate must be much lower. The other thing to be careful of is 5.7%. Because it, it's not linear. As you get closer to that number, it's, it starts, you know, you start going from valuations of $500 to $5 million really fast. So, you know, if your long-term growth rate is 5.29%, you can get a massive valuation for the firm because it's you know, it's going to affect it. So you got to be careful on this best case. So what do you do if your best case is too low? Well, you go back and rewrite part of your paper to justify high number as if you meant it all along. Is that a student or is that a professional? It's both. Yeah, we do that. It's like, oh wait, I get I get unreasonable numbers. Oh, I didn't really mean 0.4. Why did I say point? I meant 0.5. I just typed it wrong. So yeah, we we tend to rationalize when we just can't get the assumptions to work. So I do want three scenarios and on beta. Again, I keep forgetting to bring the Merck example. I forget how many betas they have. It was quite a few. So they did a lot more scenarios than this. We're also going to talk about doing data tables where there we can run multiple scenarios from like 0.2 all the way up to 0.9 or whatever. And we can do many, many more scenarios and look look at the full gamut. So that's that's not going to be an issue. All right. So we got paper, whatever it is, four done. What questions do you have on paper four? Does this feel like a process? This is what you do in practice. This is this is the process. Now, what was the process when I was a security analyst? I remember walking in. The process was analyze these stocks. That was the entire training. Um, Ron analyzed these stocks. Okay. It's like, okay, I've taken a CFA exam. I'll just do what they did there. There's no training whatsoever. They did have me talk to the portfolio managers. So the utility portfolio manager, he trained me by he walked over with a stack of books and put them on my desk. Took him like 13 seconds to train me. The um, tech guy, some of you have heard this story before, he had lunch with me. He literally said, you know, I don't think I'm exaggerating, but exaggerating, but no, he literally said, you have one hour. After that, I don't want to ever talk to you again. Ask whatever questions you have. So I'm asking questions. It's like, hours up. He left. Very arrogant guy. He lost his job later. I wasn't happy about it, but I, I didn't shed tears, but I wasn't happy about it. But it's still a very arrogant guy. So you need this kind of process because a lot of times you're going to walk into a place where it's just it's entirely up. To, I know some local firms here, some of the smaller shops, some of my students have worked for them. and. They just did what they did in papers four and five because <laughs> they had no training and that's the way they did it. They just they just put it. 
So you have to have some process. If you go to JP Morgan or Goldman, depending on where you are, they they may have something that they'll show you how to, you know, what they expect. I think I think JP Morgan has a fairly intensive training for their entry level security analysts. But I don't know exactly what they show in there or what they present. Um, but have some process. If you did this, you'd be you'd be perfectly fine. It wouldn't be considered like, what are you doing? Where'd you come from? All right. Now I'll say if you took my investment class, you've got this paper written, but you really don't because the world's changed so radically since then. So you're gonna have to edit it quite dramatically. Okay, so now let's do valuation. So let's just look at what assumptions we need. So we need our KE, we've got that. We need dividend zero. That's easy. Well, not so easy. So where to get dividend zero? Now, for some reason, earnings is trailing 12 months but dividends is forward. I don't know why Yahoo Finance changed this. This You can't use this number. It's a nonsensical number. All they did is they took the last quarter dividend and multiplied by four. Dividend zero is actually the last four quarters added together. So you have to go back and get the last four quarters, so 56. So they just took 56 times four. That's how you got that 224. Our number is actually 223. You must not say that's a big difference, but that's that's true. The four dividend would imply, imply dividend one, but this isn't dividend one because it's likely to be 56, 56, I mean, 56, 57, 57, 57. It's likely to be 227. That's only one and a half percent higher, but still it's, you know, it is a different number. And Walmart's so predictable, but if you got a stock that's you know 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 percent, it makes a huge difference which to use. So go into Yahoo Finance and get the dividends only history and just add up the last four quarters. So I've already forgotten what it was. 223. Is that what I said? So what other options do you have? So you have free cash flow. Per share to equity. You can get that from Bloomberg or calculate. If you calculate it, what I'll usually do to just keep it simple is cash from operations minus cap X divided by shares standing. And CFO, I mean CFO zero minus CapEx, or let me make it even clearer. CFO trailing 12 months minus CapEx trailing 12 months. So that's an approach that can work. So if you're doing it, so NVIDIA, right? No dividends whatsoever. So if you were to do an NVIDIA, I don't like hooked on NVIDIA. It's just I can only remember his stock. I'm trying to remember. I know we got Coca-Cola over there. I have no idea on Colin. Can't remember. I don't know why some of your stocks have. I can't remember. But financials, cash flow statement, um, annuals. So now I say trailing 12 months. Trailing 12 months, you would actually bring up the quarterlies and do the last four quarters. Does that make sense? So your CFO. Right there. Well, that is trailing 12 months. Should be the same, you would hope, but not sure. I'm, I'm going to go with this number. Can y'all tell real quick? One, two, nine, five, nine, six, nine, seven, four. That looks about right. So let's go with it. Seven, five, five, three. Cap X. Where is Cap X? Investing or financing? Investing. So you have to decide what you're going to include. You might be better off with uh, going back to your capital IQ and pulling it and pulling actual CapEx. Let's go with this line one, two, eight, nine. 
you can decide whether purchasing another machine, another business is part of your capex, but usually it's just going to be this net PPE 1289. And then shares out. Oh, under statistics. Shares outstanding, 2.49 billion. And I'm not assuring you, Chad, that I did this right because I did it fast, but $2.52 maybe. Does that make sense? What's the stock price? 134, that doesn't seem unreasonable. It's a high growing company. So yeah, it's gonna have a high uh, free cash flow, uh, multi multi multiple. So, so you can calculate yourself or you can go to Bloomberg and just type in free cash flow for share for equity and they'll, they'll bring it up. So I might do that for Walmart as well because some of your stocks are paying dividends that have nothing to do with free cash flow. So remember, the reason we're using dividends is we're assuming it's a proxy for free cash flow. So just use free cash flow instead. So Costco is a good example, right? You got a big problem with Costco because it's your dividends are all over the place. Then forget dividends and look at the free cash flow share or take five years of dividends and, and normalize it or whatever. You know, you have kind of a problem that's such a mess. Walmart, the 223 probably is a good proxy for their for free cash flow. We need earnings per share zero that we can get right off of yahoo statistics i mean yahoo this entry page five dollars we need inflation we do have that number already right use the same number you've already gotten what do we say for inflation Where do we get the 550 from? Where's the 550? There it is, 250. We need long-term growth and short-term growth. And we need the H. Apply. Uh, let's go look and see what we thought nominal GDP was going to be. That's that five and a half percent. So if our economy is going to grow up five and a half percent, let's just start with that. Walmart's not going to grow at 12 percent. It's not going to probably grow at zero percent. So you think at least grow with inflation if they don't build any more stores. I wouldn't think Walmart's going to grow as fast as our economy. I was reading an article on Amazon, but there were I haven't noticed it, but the article mentioned Target and Walmart are picking up a lot of online sales. Does that seem right to you? Are y'all shopping on Walmart more often? I think we talked about this before doing, but now it's in the articles that somehow, I don't know where the data is coming from to actually say people are doing that. I've never heard Target like that. I don't know what Target's website looks like. So maybe Walmart is just bringing back some of the, some of the business that lost at Amazon, but long, long term, I would, I would consider them to be a, growing more slowly in, in, but you have to put some discussion in there, but it really, to me, it really does come down to relative to GDP. And we're talking long-term, so separated. The short term is if there is some hyper growth, then yeah, that shouldn't influence this, this number. Um, so long-term, what do you think this is gonna be? And so for Walmart, my point is gonna be ultimately, it's inflation plus population growth. I mean, it's all that's left. They can't do anything else. Um, you need more bodies and you need inflation. So that to me is about 4%, 2, 2.5% two inflation, 1, 1.5% 1, 1 population growth. You just, you can't do anything more than that. So I don't see how they can do much more. Um, the economy can grow because some small companies are coming in and building new stores and they're, they're growing fast, but Walmart is, they're already about as many places as they can be. Now, short-term growth, this is, 
the most difficult one. Y'all, y'all remember the three things I, we, we talked about? The peg ratio, y'all remember that one? Sustainable growth. And then you can look at history. Paper three, paper, paper four, paper three. Well, I'm so confused. What was your forecast? Four. Have I said the right page number, paper number yet in this class? I should never, I should start giving them like nicknames or something. I'm just not even used. Uh, the industry paper, the uh, company paper, the analysis paper. So this is the uh, valuation paper. So paper four, your forecast. You've got Bloomberg analyst. So you got you got a lot of places to look, and these can give you radically different answers, radically radically answers. So here, your growth is PE ratio divided by the peg ratio, and which PE ratio? Forward P forward PE ratio divided by the peg ratio. We can look at that for Walmart. This is where Yahoo find it gets so confusing. I don't know why. So um, do you use the current and last quarter? You get some pretty radical answers here. It looks pretty consistent for Walmart. But so the Ford PE is 2164. The peg is 363. So that, probably about that, probably about 100, gives you 5.9, about 5.96 percent. That seems high to me, but doesn't seem outlandish. If it were 23 percent, yeah, I'd be saying, who's coming up with these numbers? Is Bloomberg still showing Costco with keeping all of their COVID and growing still? Uh, for their revenue forecast, yeah, I keep plugging the uh, ingress per store uh, into my model. It's almost perfectly in line. So it's doing very interesting. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah that just seems optimistic, but mm -hmm. it is a great store and it, it might have permanently changed people's behavior. That I don't know if I don't know if Costco's talked to people that discovered them because of COVID. I don't know if that's possible. But we're, the, like the revenue goes per store were like 18 percent. Wow. So I, I, but but in COVID, my word, I could see people were just, you know, six months lockdown, and you're worried. You know, you saw all those people, you know, long lines. You know, why not stockpile? I don't have enough space to store all that stuff, so I don't know what I would do. Um, all right, sustainable growth. Y'all remember this? ROE times one minus the payout. But more importantly, it's normalized ROE. How do you normalize ROE? Maybe you use a five-year average or median. So be careful. So especially like, I don't know about Valero, but Exxon, Exxon's been all over the place. So you've got to, you kind of have to kind of cut that in, in the middle. So these needs to be normalized. And with Costco, the payout might have to be normalized as well, because that can be, you might look at an average over time because you kind of, you want to somehow get that that large dividend in there but that's that's what it is pretty straightforward when i when i was being taking classes early in the in the 90s this is the only form we used it was just and we didn't normalize we just used the last roe times one minus the payout that was our assumption we plugged it in and we didn't use this for short-term growth we used this for long-term growth why well because back then our discount rates were like 14.5 percent <laughs> So we could have 10% growth rates. So that's all changed now. Am I still sharing? Ah, y'all should tell me when I'm not sharing screen. Sorry about that. All right, I don't know what all I just missed. So I don't know when I thought, but that was the stuff I was talking about. <laughs> oh man. All right, so you may have to listen to my horrible voice in this part of the uh, video. I don't know how much of the screen can you see on the video. You can almost see it, so hopefully. All right. 
right, so we got our, our history and all of that. Hopefully some of that history is there, but uh, if not, I'll I'll save this, send this file to me and I'll I'll put the file in there while I'm doing the video. Okay. History, you can get this right off your uh, your uh, financial analysis paper. So, yeah, someone that's hit. All right. Thanks, Mari. So you have probably 20, 30 years of the file there. You can go back and see, maybe do rolling three years, rolling five years, and just see what their growth has been. See what looks typical. You, you might be at an, like Exxon, you may be at an incredibly high point. Or, or if you did this in 2020, maybe an incredibly low point. So you don't want to just use the last three years. You want to see what it, it can be over time through a recession, recovery, those kind of things. So three, five, or 10 years. The issue here is you can't grow from a negative. So if their earnings were negative, you're, you can't do a growth rate. So you'll just have to leave those out. Um, you could, you know, there's other ways to do it. Maybe by decade or by five years. It doesn't have to be rolling. You could say, hey, in the 80s, this is their growth rate. In the 90s, this is their growth rate. Or from 95 to 2000, from 2000 to 2005, here's their growth rates. However you want to do it. But something gives you a sense of what's, you know, the, the key here is what's a reasonable range. So if the fastest they've ever grown is 7.8%, you're probably not going to use a 12% short-term growth rate unless you have something spectacular that's going on with this firm. Make sure it's consistent with paper four. If you wanted to on paper four, take your EPS five years out or your forecast paper, take your EPS five years out and the growth rate off of EPS today. What growth rate do you actually have? You could just use that. And then Bloomberg just gives you kind of an outside professional view, but then who are these analysts? What do they know? They're, they obviously know more than we do because they, that's all they do. 60 hours a week, they're staring at just a few handful of companies. So they know these companies really, really well. They may have a bias where they do tend to overstate their companies. So they may be on the high end. So maybe Bloomberg becomes your, your best case scenario. Right. So for Walmart, I, I my sense of Walmart is they're somewhat close to their terminal, their terminal value. They're kind of almost there. They are doing some exciting things. It is a very impressive firm. They've got good management. They've been beat, beaten up in the past, and they've somehow have fixed their reputation. Some they still have some issues with minimum wage and with healthcare and all those kind of things with their employees. So they have some employee issues. But what helped them a lot was Amazon. I think people hate Amazon more than Walmart now. So that's, you know, it's kind of a nice thing is you let the big guy get beat up and you kind of sit back. And I think that's what Walmart has done is kind of silently sit back in the back and let Amazon get beat up, um, especially under Trump, you know, and you buy the Washington Post or whatever it is, you know, I can get a lot of love from a Republican president. So I, I think I think they could do some interesting things. So let's let's say 7% and see what is your rationale. So if I were you, I would say, maybe go back to your forecast paper and talk about it. For, so we're talking about uh, curbside, might make some sense, home delivery, uh, same day store pickup, which seems to be pretty exciting. And home delivery could be DoorDash, or it could be drone, who knows what's gonna come. Um, it could be autonomous vehicles. I don't really know. I've, I've seen some of the um, robotics in some cities, like New York and places, that's mainly delivering food. I don't see how you could do that to deliver groceries. Groceries are a bit of a challenge because they're kind of bulky. They're perishable, they're frozen, so it gets a little tougher. I don't know if any, have any of y'all done home delivery with groceries? 
does it work pretty well? It comes cold. Do you have frozen food? They have special cars, or just some some guy in his pickup. Yeah. So I mean, there's issues there, right? They have an exit on the way, or if they drop the food, or, or I've seen the DoorDash people that are like eating your food on the way over, kind of thing. So you know, there's some issues there that creates whole new issues that they got to control quality, which is tough to control quality if you're doing DoorDash because they're no longer your employees. It's going to affect your margins. Um, but this might be their their saving grace is the fact that they have so many stores and they're everywhere. I think Target somewhat has that advantage. Uh, I'm still amazed Amazon home delivers same day. I think that's pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, if you need it like in 10 minutes, you don't want to stand in line to the grocers. You can just run in, pick it up and leave. But um, and then the online, I don't know what they're doing online that's making them uh, better. I do think there's a connection between the online and the same store sell. I think the reason people are doing online with Walmart is because there's a Walmart right around the corner. It makes home delivery easy. It makes stores same same day pickup from the store easier. Whatever. So maybe maybe they got they got some excitement coming on here. Um, the one thing that amazed me most, uh, I think, Juan Carlos, you talked about this. That you talked Amazon. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. If y'all were there last night, he did you talk about it last night or was it last week? Well, I remember it was really good. I just can't remember what day is which, but how much AWS AWS is of their earnings? The retail is nothing. Yeah. They're not making money from retail. <laughs> it's a really horrible business. Yep, ninety percent of our business and twenty percent of their earnings. Yeah, it's a lot of employees, a lot of headaches, a lot of capital, and not much earnings, which implies Amazon's going to have to increase prices. They're going to have to increase prices on Amazon Prime. They're going to have to increase prices on their products, their spread. They're just not making money in retail. And if they spin off AWS, it's going to be horrible. That's when you're really going to see it. And they're going to. So that may be in Walmart's favor. Amazon is a great competitor because they're unprofitable. And they've gone as far as they can go on that. Now they're going to have to throw in the towel and start, start charging more. So I can put that in the case for Walmart because Walmart, I think, is probably as well run as Amazon from their warehouses and those kind of things. I don't know how much, you know, Amazon gets so much press. I doubt Walmart's that far behind. <laughs> in fact, I think there's some, they're probably, Walmart might be ahead of them in a lot of places because they seem to understand how they get stuff in the store right on time. Um, there are other things going on that are exciting to me. Um, some of these, um, Fintech stuff that's going on could be exciting. I could put that down there. You might say um, the crazy stuff. What's that kind of, gee, wow, if this happens, this could be great. That's that kind of that optionality thing. So the Fintech, Walmart has their own credit card, their own bank. They've been trying to get a bank for some time. And boy, that, you know, this is a firm whose margins are what, by 8%? What happens if they can eliminate the Visa, MasterCard, 2% exchange fee? That is That increases their profitability 20%, just like that. That would be huge. And, and that's what people are thinking is, you know, we're, you're going to have a credit card on your phone. Anytime you walk into Walmart, it engages. You buy stuff from Walmart. There's no exchange. Walmart lets you use that card essentially for free or however, there may be you know, a little bit where you pay interest if you don't pay off the bill. But as far as the exchange where you have to compensate banks for that, Walmart might say, hey, this is a service we're providing, so you use us. Yeah, that, that could be massive to their 20% you know, pickup in earnings. That would be pretty massive for a firm that's um, that tight margin. But anyway, you know, I don't know Walmart that well, so I'm just making stuff up off of my head. You know your company much better after doing your company analysis and industry analysis. And, you know, Anthony, yours can be EVs, um, global warming. And Anthony was saying that Valero is really doing quite a bit of bio, biofuels that could be accepted by the global, global warming people. That that can be their new growth engine. I don't know how fast that's growing versus the others and how what its margins are. But here it's it's a sense of giving yourself a good excuse for your assumptions. And in the half-life, that's the hardest part of all. And I don't know what to tell you there. 
So you look at your lists and you say, okay, that's already kind of already going. They're getting some of that. They're just going to get better at it. Home delivery, uh, certainly COVID is pushing this much faster. I, I was shocked. I think I drove, I think it was a 7-Eleven advertising home delivery. Just like, that's, that's crazy. How can they possibly get that to work as a business model? But home delivery seems to be getting more popular. Um, so the online, they may just be starting with that. They bought jet.com not too long ago. I haven't looked at the website, but what can they do to really get that going? Maybe what they start doing is competing with Amazon and start offering a lot of other stuff besides just what they provide. Who knows what they could do? And then the fintech, that's that's still quite a ways off. But if that happens, you know, that would be great. So whatever. There's a lot of discussion. You're trying to provide rational, rational basis behind your assumptions. And so let's say, I don't know, four years. I just made that number up. And don't do what I do with the USAA account. It's 4.2351. I used to do that all the time, but don't don't do that. If if you don't have precision in a number, don't go out decimal places. Okay. That's why I rounded my inflation rate to two and a half percent. I didn't use 2.37, even though that's what the number said. If you don't have precision, don't imply it with your assumptions. And then it's just valuation. So given discount model, cap earnings, H model, those are the three. You have to use at least three models. So given discount model, given in zero times one plus long-term growth, divided by KB minus long-term growth. H model, the exact same thing, except plus to zero times H times short term growth. That's long term growth. You can type growth that way every single time. And cap earnings, exact same thing again, except for we're going to use earnings per share. We're going to use inflation. Use inflation. So those are the three models I'm going to use. Now, my long, my growth for DDM is long-term growth. One exception I would make if I were doing, there's got to be another high growth company in here besides NVIDIA that, I can, that I'll keep picking on Ted. Who else is doing a high growth tech? Maybe that's the reason I'm picking on recently high growth. It's not Coca-Cola. Monster kind of is. So let's take Monster, right? So I don't. So if my long-term growth in these two are the same, the problem with that is I think this firm's going to grow. And sorry, with H model and DDM, I think this firm's going to grow really, really fast for another ten years. So that implies if short-term is a lot above long-term and H is material. That might give you an ar argument for making your long-term growth rate here higher than it is in the H model. Because the H model is assuming you're growing fast and then you're going to have this terminal growth. The dividend discount model is assuming you're growing the same rate all the time. So what could you do? You could actually figure this out. Okay, let me just show you. I'll go out 100 years, maybe. I'll go out 100 years. Oops. And we're going to grow one dollar. We're going to grow it at thirty percent, and they're going to slowly come down over time until they hit six percent. And then they're going to grow six percent forever. Ah. So what does that imply? Well, that times one plus that. So what can we do with that? He guesses that raised to what? One divided by 100. 
Minus one will be higher than 6%. Yes, how much higher than 6%? 7.46. You'll see what I did. We grew pretty fast. What if it only grows 10%? And then 10%, eight down to six. And it's not much more than six. You'll see what I'm doing? Go out 100 years and figure out that long-term growth rate if you have those fast growths in the beginning. Okay, any questions on that? So you can have a long, you can have two long-term growth rates, one for the age model and one for the dividend discount model, because the dividend discount model assumes that's a constant the whole whole time. All right, so it's really a matter of plugging these in. Now I want to run scenarios. So on Walmart. My long-term growth, I want to have three scenarios. I'll talk probably next class about how, how to handle the age model. Before I do that, I want to show you one other model that I've given y'all. It says papers. It says paper six. Sorry. I don't, I, I don't know if that's right, but proprietary stock valuation model. So it's under class models and templates. I actually think this is a fairly decent model. So I was doing Google, so let's do Google. So Google's earnings are whatever they are now. I think it's funny, Google's alphabet, but they didn't change their ticker. Facebook is meta and they changed their ticker. I wonder how much, it, how much does it cost to change your ticker? I bet it's pretty expensive. Um, all right, so their earnings. Whoa, did they do a stock split? Wow, how did I miss that? They did, when did they do their stock split? How did I miss that? Like a 10 to one or something? Wow, boy, where have I been? Okay, four. I was gonna say I was expecting like 40, 50, 60 bucks. Okay, four ninety four. All right. So Google's doing everything. We don't know what they're doing. They're somewhat private about this, but they're they're in the medicine. They're in the cars. They're in the obviously cloud and advertising. They're doing some exciting things. Uh, didn't do too well this last reporting, but that was just one quarter. So let's give them 20 years. Let's say their, their long-term growth, say five and a half percent. And they're going to start growing at 25%. Risk-free rate, 405. Market risk premium is four. Beta, 135. Ultimate. And so this is a firm that pays no dividends. I'm going to assume their growth rate starts at 25% and it's going to go from 25% to 5.5% over 20 years. So I'm going to start at 25 and I'm going to go down. So what it does is it says, okay, give me your starting growth rate. And given the number of years, I'm going to make sure after that number of years, I'm down to 5.5%. And then the model says, whenever it hits that 5.5%, I want them to start paying a 40% dividend. Why 40? Because that's a typical dividend payout ratio for an S&P 500 stock. Y'all okay, see how that is? It's, this is kind of like the H model, but where you don't have to have dividends. And so when I do that, I get a price of 149.70, much higher than the current price. But I probably wasn't that far off. Um, wasn't that far off back here. There it is, 149. I'm just a little behind the, the times. But uh, 149. So you can definitely use this model to do, use this model to do scenarios. You just have to plug in different assumptions and get the number and put it into your paper. So you can't like run them one model. So this is available to you. You don't, you can, any stock that doesn't pay dividends, you can certainly put this, this into that model. So if you, if you're paying dividends, I wouldn't use it because the H model essentially gets you the same thing and it's much easier to do the math. But um, so very simplistic approach, but I, I, I think it actually works. All right, so let's put our final assumptions in. 
I think I had them before. I just need to uh, on the long term growth, short term growth. So base, worst, best. Base, I'm using 4%. Worst, I'll give them inflation. Best, I'll give them. Remember, we've got that. We got that 573 breathing down on us, so I got to keep that below there. Short-term growth, my base was 7%. My worst is say 5% or even 4%. I'm just going to make it so there is no difference. And best case scenario, something crazy happens, make it 10%. I wouldn't monitor, I wouldn't change the H you get too many moving pieces. We'll talk about it. It gets a little tough. You have more than one thing changing because you, your scenarios go crazy, but I'll show you how and I'll show you next because it's a little complicated on the H model, how to do a data table when you have more than two things. A data table is great if you have two things that change. If you have more than two things to change. We have to somehow associate them and I'll show you how you, how you can do that. Okay. So my dividend and discount model. I take dividend zero, 223 times one plus my long-term growth rate divided by KE minus long-term growth gives me $90. Can I copy this over? What I need to do with dividend, better lock that in. Growth, I can leave that like it is. KE, that needs to be copied over, right? There's three scenarios there, long-term growth. So I can copy everything else over. So why did I get 320.75? Because 573 and five are really close to each other. I think Walmart's worth $300. We'll talk about it when you did that a table. Cap earnings. Here I use earnings per share, zero times one plus my inflation rate, which is 250 divided by KE minus 250. And it's not uncommon to get a value that's higher when the long-term growth and inflation aren't that far apart and the earnings is much higher than the dividend, you can get higher numbers. So lock in the earnings per share and here lock in the inflation. So the only thing that's changing here is my discount rate. I've had several kind of go, uh, General Mills, Campbell Soup, those type where you see that the cap earnings give you a higher valuation than dividend discount model. And then the H model, here I'm gonna lock in as I go. So I've got dividend zero times one plus long-term growth. Don't need to lock that in plus dividend zero times H. I can lock that in as well if I can find it. Times short-term growth minus long-term growth divided by KE minus long-term growth. I think I got it all. But how can I check it? What's the difference between H model and the dividend discount model? It's that little piece right there, isn't it? So that should be the difference in the two. So just to check and make sure I didn't pick up a bad line somewhere. So yeah, 90, 24, 46, 55, 30, 25. So that extra growth period is adding $10 are about 11% to the value. Not as much on the uh, worst case, so only adding 273. And in the best case, it's adding a whole lot, $61, because that's a pretty high growth rate. However, if you notice that cap earnings is it's one of the highest numbers there. All right, that makes sense. How do you convert this? You may not do the football chart 
in this paper, you may save it to the next paper, but how would you do it? You start with zero, you then do the lowest value, and then you do the next value minus the lowest value. Actually, I, I don't think they even do that. I think you just, you do the lowest value and the highest value. I don't, I'm not gonna do that for this. I'm gonna do it for, well, you know, let's do it. It's, I don't like my highest value at all. I, I tell you what, I'm gonna, just so I get better numbers, you're probably gonna do this. <laughs> this is what a lot of students do. Oh, the current price is 130. Oh, I meant this to be four and a half percent. That's, that happens a lot. But I'm gonna do it just so I get better football charts. So you take zero, then you take the lowest number, then you take the highest number minus the lowest number, put those into a graph, and then you're gonna insert a graph. One of the sideways graphs like that. And you get rid of that one. Nope. You, um, oh, I'm sorry. You change this to no outline and no fill. So I'm going from, does it look right? I'm going from well, Bill Gates, you can do it. I'm going from 90 to 189. So I messed something up. No, I'm going from, I'm sorry, I'm going from 46 to 189. There it is, 46 to, is that 189? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. But then change the color here, maybe the blue, the color here, blue. So what happened to my third one? Where is this one? What did I do? All right, let's do it again. So it should, if you did it right, when you add it across, it should equal 189. Because the bar is going to be stacked. It's going to take 0 plus 46 plus 142. That should add up to 159. That should add up to 229. I don't know why it didn't do that for me. Yeah, you all know why it's not putting the, the first one in there? Ah, that's the problem. Okay, the smallest, the smallest. All right, well, I'll have to figure it out. I thought I had it had it down. Anybody see my problem? Y'all show me what I did wrong. Maybe I picked the wrong chart. I just have to see. No, nope, it's not that one. Yeah, I don't know what it's what I'm doing wrong. All right, I'll have to watch. Um, I'll watch the um, the video again. And they'll show you how to do it. A football field chart are these various different valuation methods here. So we select those labels. You want to go sideways. You don't First want to go game. like that. So let's do a sideways one. Before we were using Monday.com, our team was rounding. Our days used to start to be more. There you go. He's got minimum, difference, and max. So once you have your data, for you will do the annual function. Um, I'm going to this one here, or very much 
Next, we are going to select other than go to insert and we will choose charts. That's what I did. All right. Here you can see that it is starting to go below the acceptable views. All right, let's let's try that and see. So he said again, max difference. He selected them. Does that look right so far? <laughs> then we're going to make those no outline, no fill. That's looking better. So that's 40 to 189. Thanks, Bill Gates. He's always there to help you. So the first one is right here, goes from, still doesn't look right to me, but that's 159. Yeah, it still doesn't look right to me. But anyway, y'all can watch the video. Y'all see the video. This is a better video. I don't know who this is. Quant Prep. Hey, it's one of your buddies called. So it's some quant guy teaching some pretty basic stuff. <laughs> Uh, over the heads of finance professors, but still pretty basic. So anyway, why do you want to do this? Well, because you see these things all the time now. So you want to somehow help figure out how to do it. I don't know when they started showing up. It seems like about five years ago, everybody started using Have y'all seen these a lot in your papers? Do y'all use it in your other classes or is this just an industry thing? So you try to get them into your paper. Just it's the going thing now. It looks good. And he, and he has almost the same thing. He's got DCF, that's our dividend discount. DCF growth, I don't know, maybe he's at a higher growth. We're going to do this in the next paper and this in the next paper. So that's why it makes more sense in the next paper, but you might go ahead and set it up now so you're ready for it, so you can see those ranges. The one thing I add to it is I put the current stock price. What some people do that I don't like is they'll put the 52-week range in there. You could do that but I like to have a big line right where the current stock price is. Because what I'm looking for are stocks where their price, not necessarily that they're way over here, but that their stock price is in the lower quadrant down here. I don't want a stock that's over here. And so I want to see, I want the current price to be very, very prominent. If you can't figure out how to put a line in the middle of a graph and just draw it by hand and put it at what the current price is. If you want to put the 52 week in there, you could, you know, if you did that for NVIDIA, it might take the whole chart. So it might, might you, know, you have to kind of look and see what you have to work with. Um, I think it's a powerful approach. Uh, I don't know why he has these numbers that are on the side. So we'll have to watch this video. May I, I need to watch this video again. I thought I had it figured out. But it still doesn't look right to me. So, But your, your goal is to get that range. So you can see, and you're going to have three valuation models in this paper. You'll have a, a couple in the next paper. And you're going to put them all together and try to figure out is this a buy or, or sell based on that range and then what you're going to do is when you do the exact summary which is the very last paper this is one of the most likely charts for you to put in that exact summary it's, it's the one people usually are looking for all right and if you use the proprietary growth model you can put that in there as well and then you just you just put the three ranges of whatever you ran in there there's someone out there who knows how to do this and they're just not speaking up. So I made some mistakes somewhere in here. So what I'm recommending is stop here and wait for our next paper. So the rubric says that the last thing I grade here is your conclusion. I want you to essentially leave the conclusion off of here and put it in the next paper. And that's why I combine these three papers together. I used to do the next two and then the next paper was later. I combined them so that you can put your final summary here. It doesn't make sense to do a football chart on 
on this and then do another one when you do relative values. So I'd rather you just stop here, finish up this, don't have a conclusion, just stop. And then we'll, we'll go to the relative value after that. All right. So we're probably we're kind of short on time. Um, what I want to show you, the other thing is a data table. Now, there's a couple ways we can do data tables. One, you can use a data table in Excel. The other is you just create it by hand using the, the anchor, which I'm kind of getting more to that. But what we'll do, I'll do this next class, but what we want to do is work on scenarios on beta and work on scenarios on growth. So our betas might range from say 0 0.25 up to 0.9, and our growth might range from say 0 0.025 up to 0 0.07. You might say seven's too high. Well, that means we're gonna get some negative numbers in the graph. We're gonna use the uh, conditional formatting, just block those out so we can't even see them. So we might get a valuation for Walmart of say $62,000. Say, hey, any valuation over $300 is block it out. Why? Because you can't go to your boss and show the table with the $62,000 and say, just ignore that because they're going to talk about that for the next three hours. You block it out so they can't see it. I learned that with my boss very, very early on. If they can find something to criticize, don't give them the easy points like that. So hide that kind of stuff. So we're going to hide the, the really bad looking ones. And then we're going to try to figure out green are sort of where the valuations are higher than our current stock price reds for ones that are lower we're going to try to see if the green or the red dominate in our matrix so we'll do that next class have y'all done data tables as well do y'all like doing data tables or you, or you prefer using the formula because my problem with data tables is they're just unwieldy to deal with if you want to make changes anytime you try to delete something or whatever it just they do they go kind of crazy and you can get the same thing just doing by, you know, equaling and doing dollar signs and that kind of thing. So we'll see. I'll, I'll do it both ways and you, you can see how it works. All right. Well, any questions on anything? Some of y'all had questions about paper, your financial analysis paper. This weekend's pretty rough because I got a lot of meetings, but I'll be available Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday after, say, 6, 6.30. So if you want to set up a Zoom. Some of y'all on your financial analysis paper could probably add 10 points by doing some really easy things. You just left out something really obvious. Um, some of y'all got really mixed up on the um, working capital and just some of y'all say it's definitely a use of cash. Next paragraph, this source of cash, it's like, wait a minute, you gotta go back and read. So sometimes it's really obvious stuff that you just, you, and, and really 70% of it is trying to use too much of the Walmart language. There's places where y'all need to just delete the Walmart paragraph and write your own. And you try to keep too much of it and it just, that's just messed you up. So, so I can probably help you get at least 10 points back pretty fast and probably even more than that. So, all right.